Hi, good afternoon. This is Angel with Beauty and Beast in Business and the Pro Firm. I'm here today speaking with Megan Hodge from Call to Bear. I'm really excited to have this conversation because Megan and her company have come about during the time of pandemic when most people are not creating new companies. And it's not just important about that, but actually what it is that Call to Bear does. So Megan, I am so happy to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Angel. I'm thrilled to be here as well. And yes, you know, 2020 is quite an interesting year to be launching a new business. Um, but Call to Bear is an inclusive culture advisory practice. And I part of that practice is also a coaching practice that is geared towards the advancement of women in the workforce and working with individuals who are pivoting in their career. So the scope of cultivare and and the the mission of cultivare and what we're doing actually is quite timely for 2020 but i'll take a step back because the origins of cultivare started long before this unusual year that we're all in and my background is in the insurance industry on the reinsurance side i i started out my career in consulting but spent close to 20 years on the reinsurance broking side um Working, you know, my way through um, up through positions of leadership, I was always client facing, so I was responsible for managing client relationships, for growing client books of business, for growing new business, and then ultimately over time, responsible for PLs or had strategic operational roles within my organizations. But the reinsurance industry um, is as I say, the dinosaur end of a dinosaur industry in terms of diversity and inclusion. Uh, the reinsurance industry is predominantly white male, certainly you know, at, at leadership levels, at C-suite levels, at board levels, but really from, I would say, kind of mid-management level on up. So throughout my entire career, while my, my day job was client-facing and you know, part of leadership teams in my organizations, my passion, has always been to focus on the advancement of women and broader diversity and inclusion initiatives within the industry. So that would be within the own, you know, the organizations at which I worked, as well as more broadly across the industry. And in fact, um, this fall, I am one of the co-city leads for Dive In Chicago's um, 2020 event, as well as the IICF Midwest um, regional forum for women. They've actually now consolidated all of the regional forums in 2020 to one virtual platform. Um, but I was originally one of the, the co-chairs for the ISCF's forum. So my involvement in diversity, equity, and inclusion work, you know, really spanned across a number of organizations and, and the broader insurance industry. Over time, while I felt encouraged that you know more organizations were genuinely on board with the importance of diversity you know in terms of improved performance of organizations of a healthier risk appetite um a i would say a lesser fear of failure so a willingness to try and be more innovative um and also just in terms of attracting top tier talent you know i, I felt that there definitely have been organizations in the industry that have been genuine in their desire and commitment to become more diverse. But it really became apparent that, that there still was no traction um, or very limited traction, I guess, in actually achieving greater diversity predominantly through the talent pipeline. You know, I think the, the one area where organizations have started to make some inroads is in entry level hiring. Um, but in terms of retention of diverse talent or growing the talent pipeline at, at more senior levels, you know, that's still very anemic. So that was the origin of starting Cultivare. I thought, you know, how can I make an impact in an industry that I'm committed to that I've spent so much of my career um, you know, growing and thriving in and making connections with so many incredible women and men? And when I looked at where organizations who were committed to diversity um, were struggling, it was really at that foundational level, that, that culture of their organization. For an organization has to be inclusive. Individuals have to feel like they belong, like they are welcome for who they are, that they don't need to assimilate, but that the very characteristics that make them unique are seen and valued and respected. And 
that they have an opportunity within that organization, you know, just not for their immediate role, but to grow and to develop a career within that organization. And so the focus of Cultivare really is to work with organizations on fostering and growing cultures of inclusion. And the second kind of pillar of Cultivare is focused on coaching, predominantly women um, who have risen, you know, in their career, have been rising stars, are now in leadership positions, are positioned, you know, potentially to move into executive positions or already are in those positions, but have really started to experience microaggressions in their career and have started seeing, you know, the the glass ceiling, maybe have experienced the glass cliff, but but even more so are saying, you know, do I do I want to opt out of this? Is this really the place for me if I'm going to consistently be devalued, if I'm going to consistently having have my competence challenged, if I'm going to consistently be viewed as a token. Um, and so on one hand I'm working with organizations on culture and on the other hand I'm working with women or individuals looking to pivot into roles um, so that together there can be this kind of push and pull to right. drive greater inclusion in the industry, which in turn will attract, develop, and retain greater diversity of talent. Well, I think it's also an amazing way to balance things out because what we see is, you know, two and a half years ago when I started uh, the pro firm, which is Professional Females and Risk Management, um, I honestly really didn't know what I was doing. I just knew it was my mission. It was something that I felt so strongly about because I was mentoring other women and my career escalated very quickly. So, you know, within four years, I was an operations manager. Within seven years, I was a senior risk manager overseeing a national program. And um, I had people or actually service partners who knew claims adjusters that were getting into risk management and they were like, they're lost. They're feeling those microaggressions, right? Because um, they were going, even though we do have, you know, a number of female risk managers uh, based on the, the labor uh, website, we are outnumbered one to 15. So there's still some room for growth. But what was happening was I was seeing these women go into male dominated you know, companies and corporations and feeling like they were not being heard, they were not being set up for success, they were right. not being provided the tools that they needed to be successful. Right. And that's how the pro firm started. So when I see Cultivare, it is for me an amazing, amazing company, the thing that you're doing, because it's so important for us to, of course, uh, mentor women or give them the tips and the tools that they need to navigate their careers. But we also know that if there's not a change from the top, that doesn't really continue to allow growth for a person, whether it's a female or a male, right. whether are white, black, or brown, whatever, if they have, you know, different abilities, whatever it is, if that change from that corporate culture doesn't begin from the C-suite in the top, right? Um, there's a huge disparity in the middle. And you have exactly what you said, a retention deficit, because you can hire great people. And if they feel like they have to change who they are to fit in, which many times people do, because guess what, in order to climb that ladder and be very successful and get that increase in pay and salary that need and benefits um they either have to change or they have to leave and it's a scary thing when you have to decide that it's time to go so right. speaking about that i mean yes you have 20 years of experience in the corporate world and you wanted to continue your mission what was that final push for you that said you know what i think i'm ready i'm ready to create my own company and make a huge difference in the world well, you know, it's interesting. Um, having spent my career in the business of risk, I'm a fairly risk averse person. So starting my own business was never something that was on my radar. It wasn't a bucket list item. It wasn't, you know, my ultimate objective. Um, but I have made a few significant career pivots throughout my career, despite being risk averse. And I would say 
definitely in my mid thirties after I'd had both of my children, I have two children, you know, I really started to take stock and assess my career because now I was a working mother. I was traveling a ton. I had a career that was very important to me and being an active and present parent and, and partner to my husband was very important to me too. So I really had to evaluate how I was optimizing my time and, and what I was putting into it, what I was, how I was able to add value, you know, both professionally and personally, and what that meant to me as a person. Was it aligned to my passion? And so one of the things I work on with, with coaching clients is developing this career journey assessment that's very specific to an individual. And, and you know, I started with mine in my mid thirties um, and the parameters, the benchmarks I've identified have largely stayed the same. And, and so for me to feel successful, my you know, personal and professional success and my mental and physical health cannot come at the expense of one another. They have to be achieved as a collective. And I hesitate to even use the word balance because we're working moms. We know balance is, <laughs> is this mythical unicorn. We but, call it collaboration because there's yeah. always that give and take from- Right. But with, with you know, how I evaluate that success, it's not that every day or even every week or month is going to be perfectly, you know, in equilibrium between all of these, but it has to be over a period of time, over a period of several months. I have to feel like I am growing collectively and being, you know, achieving success and there's not a deficit in any of those categories. And then, you know, when I look professionally and, and this helps me determine whether or not to take a risk to make a move, I look at, um, Am I adding value to an organization? You know, am, am I uniquely my my core competencies, my skill sets, my role? Am I able to add value to an organization? Am I growing and developing in alignment with my career objectives? You know, so it's one thing if you're in a role, you're adding value, you're growing, but it's in a complete opposite direction of you know, what drives you, of what your passion is, of, of where you want to go in your career. And then the third piece, and I think this is critically important, I think it's harder um, for women to prioritize this, and frankly, probably harder for a lot of folks to prioritize this, is can I be my authentic self? You know, can I bring my authentic self to the table every day? Is she respected? Is she valued? And so there's that cultural alignment. And at various points of my career, I have made decisions. Some of them have been to stay, others have been to go based on that holistic balance. When my children were young, I was in a career you know, that I, I loved. I was in an organization where I was very well supported. I had great clients, you know, great colleagues, but I recognized that the, the direction I was going in um, wasn't exactly in alignment with where I wanted to go. And I was adding value, but I, I felt like my development was getting a little stagnant. So in other circumstances, I would have looked to leave, but because my children were young, that role in which I was happy um, enabled me to be a more present parent at that point of their lives. And so that was a decision I made based on my risk tolerance and how I define success. Right. Moving on to Cultivare, you know, I launched Cultivare um, on my daughter's 10th birthday, so January 21st of this year, um, before we knew what 2020 had in store for all of us. Yeah. Um, but when I looked to move from the, the business revenue generating side into a you know fully, I would say, strategic operational talent role, I contemplated moving in-house, uh, you know, firms, in our industry are hiring chief culture officers, um, employee experience officers, chief people officers. But when I really thought about what my purpose was, my mission it, it is to drive change within the industry. And I felt that doing so as an advisor would enable me to work with more companies. And that, you know, where we've seen some of the, I would say stagnant, obstacles come into play within organizations is diversity and inclusion roles or teams get marginalized, leadership teams change. Um, there isn't a commitment 
beyond you know, lip service or window dressing, if you will. And so being an advisor would enable me to get in with organizations, you know, work through the project. And if they were an organization that was really committed to walking the walk, I could dive in further and spend, you know, more time with them. And if they weren't, I could, you know, back out after that project and move on to another organization. And then likewise, in the coaching, I feel, you know, very strongly my coaching relationships, even if I'm introduced by a company are, are strictly between me and an individual. And I worried that if I was working for a company, there might be parameters on with whom I could have coaching relationships. So when I, I explored, I, I really spent the, the fourth quarter of 2019 um, in all of the pre-launch and building out Cultivare. And although I would say I had kind of a, a bias towards not starting my own company because that is risky, it ultimately was a very easy decision because I recognized that with my mission to truly jive change, I would be able to do so at a much greater scale um, through my own organization. You know, that's something that we see so many times within companies is you have these very creative and very um, capable employees or managers who have these ideas to increase the anything, whether it be DNI, whether it be you know employee health, um, any idea to really drive that change, and they get you know a pat on the back and they're like, yes, this is great. And sometimes your upper management or C-suite or they're like, okay, yeah, this is this we we think this could work, but many times there are so many people involved that those changes don't actually occur. Right. And you look back, or it, it's, we're gonna meet again next month, next month, the next month. The next thing you know, there's a full year of discussion and you're still discussing the same thing you did 12 months before right. because change hasn't been implemented. And so um, do you see that as a, as a coach or as somebody who can come in and consult for a company, it's easier for you to, say, determine which companies are really driven to make those changes as opposed to those companies who, I like to say, they hit on a highlight because that's, you know, the word of the day is d &I. Right. So, um, you know, I, I think, again, you never fully know until you get under the covers, you know, until you spend some time and, and start working throughout the organization. And even in an organization that's incredibly committed, there are going to be hurdles. There are going to be individuals. It's typically kind of min middle management level that feel threatened on many levels by these types of initiatives. Um, so I know that that will take place. But when I look at companies with whom I will engage as an advisor, first of all, I, I have to be engaged with the C-suite. This has to be a C-suite ask and, and prioritization. So, you know, it, sometimes it's individuals in the, in the organization who will bring me in or make the introduction, but this has to be driven by the C-suite. It can't be an initiative that falls under another department or um, unofficially under, you know, likely some women, but, but potentially could be women and men in the organization who are championing it because that has the significant potential, as you said, to just um, linger in terms of discussion, linger in that discussion stage and never actually move into transformation. So, you know, the first kind of benchmark for me is, is this driven by the C-suite? That's a leading indicator. Um, the second piece is, you know, the way that I look to engage with organizations, occasionally they have a very specific ask around a type of training or a conversation to have or one specific area to focus on. And, and so we'll do that. But even in those cases, I look, sit back with them and help organizations develop an inclusive culture strategic plan. So that sits over employee experience, over operations, over talent, and over visibility, you know, being positioned as a thought leader. And the first piece of that is helping an organization de develop an inclusive culture mission statement. 
It has to be something they live and breathe. It has to be a priority um, for any sort of transformational change, particularly around DEI. It has to support the broader business objectives. So that mission statement has to support their broader business objectives. And then the changes that are being made and how you measure them, how you develop metrics for success have to support their broader business objectives as well. So that's typically my first step with an organization. And then that plan will encompass initiatives they're currently taking. It might identify ones that need to change. It will identify additional steps. Um, and then that's really telling at that point because either, you know, that can be the complete engagement and they now have this strategic plan that they can execute on their own, or they can engage me um, to help them on that execution, to bring in strategic partners to help on certain pieces. There's components that Cultivera will do. Um, you know, as Cultivera, others will, will engage strategic partners in. Um, but if they commit to that, that's very telling as well, because it's additional investment of dollars, of time, you know, of talent within their company who will have to engage in these conversations. Right. And I think at that point, there's a better likelihood, at least of success of whatever that initiative is, because to the employees, to the other leaders, they're seeing this as something our organization is spending money on. We've hired a third party to come in. And the typical methods or behaviors that allow you to push off a discussion you don't really want to advance are more difficult to do when it's a third party. And when it's a third party reporting up to your CEO saying, hey, you know, we've gotten this far, but we're held up because we can't engage this team or this team leader. Um, and that's what we need to do for the next step. Another key indicator, and I bring this up in initial conversations with C-suites, is for success to truly take place around you know, transforming cultures of inclusion, there has to be incentives and rewards for good behavior and disincentives for poor behavior. And that comes down to compensation, and that comes down to performance. And if leaders are willing to do that, if they're willing to make culture and make diversity initiatives and achievements part of the performance measurement process and a component in determining compensation, you know, not only of leaders, but of managers and team leaders throughout the organization, that is a huge indicator of willingness to change. So there are several points at which you know, I engage with organizations that either can be a continuation point or a natural ending point. And each time the decision to continue really is a commitment of them saying we're we're willing to roll up our sleeves and do some of this hard work. And that the other thing is, you know, once they've gotten, I've seen companies get all the way to that end point and they're putting dollars, you know, yep. um, into these programs. Um, Unfortunately, what happens is it's kind of like goal setting, right? So for me, I feel like you sit down and you goal set and you say, I have all of these things I want to do. Um, and then you you start to track and you get to a point that you're like, okay, this is great. I'm on my way there. But then you drop it and you don't yep. continue to, um, your goals are still there, but you're not tracking that advancement. And so right. it's to lose focus and i see that with companies a lot where they have these really great programs that they implement and they say oh well we have the bonus bucks or we have whatever it is um right. to increase the comprehension of employees into doing these positive things but then it stops there and a year later two years later these programs were implemented but they were never maintained and yep. so do you assist companies to help with that maintenance as well? Yeah. That so that's, you know, that's something I can certainly um, assist in two ways. I can either assist them with developing protocols and benchmarks and checkpoints to ensure. So help them just build that into their own operational processes, or I can stay engaged with them because the, I guess the other kind of important point to note with this is 
when you first start working with a company and start that transformation pro process, it's not one and done. Your needs are going to change. As you bring in more people, you, your coaching needs may change. Your training needs may change. Your sponsorship certainly is going to you know, elevate in importance. Um, so, you know, I think I, ideally I would stay engaged or there would be someone within that organization who would have that role and not just as a side job, but as a job that they, you know, are accountable for, that they are paid for, um, that, you know, is a, a key scope of whatever their broader role within the organization is to help um, with the evolution of their inclusive culture strategic plan and the evaluation of it. But one of the things that I focus on and that I strongly encourage organizations to do is from the onset to take a stance, to publicly state their inclusive culture mission statement, to talk about that on every call. That is something they, you know, build in their, you know, reporting externally and internally and to make statements about what their objectives are. Um, you know, I think it was Accenture's US CEO, a, a woman was one of the first CEOs to make the statement of here are our diversity objectives um, broken down very specifically. And we are going to report out to you on them, you know, annually in terms of what our progress is. And that would be the boldest step to take, to, to say, internally and externally these are our objectives and we're going to report out to you and if we you know achieve them then our you know our benchmarks will change and if we don't then we will be accountable and we'll explain what happened and what we're going to do about it um, i certainly encourage organizations to do that internally but i think it has greater bearing externally it's a it is a demonstration of their commitment out in the marketplace. It tells their partners who they are and what they stand for. It also, I think, is compelling to talent because as you and I know, talent these days, and, and not just women and, and people of color, but really all talent in, um, you know, folks who are just graduating from college um, and then certainly up, up the pipeline are, are looking at organizations and seeing, do you walk the walk? of diversity you know you it's great that you said black lives matters uh, you know that that was an important thing to say but what are you doing what do the demographics of your board look like what do the demographics of your c-suite and your leadership teams look like what programs do you have in place so that talent that you bring in that is not part of the dominant culture group in your organization have opportunities have visibility you know have a career path and plan that has the you know, potential to even be successful. Because in many cases, that's that's really not even there from the start. You know, yeah, and it has changed so much. I know, again, I mean, just going back two years, two and a half years, um, when I first started talking about the pro firm, people were very shy about wanting to have that discussion. Yeah were very shy about wanting to even sponsor an event because they're like, oh no, we can't just say just women and we can't just, you know, really focus on that information. They didn't want to talk about it. And as I started that, it was really quickly after I started that, uh, then we started to see many other um, things and organizations become very popular around that same time. And um, I would even go to conferences, the conferences Hey, Angel, we want you to present some information. Do you have a good subject? And I would open up, you know, subjects like this about DNI or about, you know, what is it that we're seeing in insurance or the work comp industry that's reflecting in our laws or in the results or in case law that's being made? And right. people didn't want to talk about that. And no. It, it was just like, uh, no, like, let, let's just continue to reiterate what we talk about every single conference. Right. And for me, there is a huge difference about speaking up and being an advocate because advocacy means there's action that backs the discussions that you're having. And what we're seeing right now is people are being pushed to the wall. 
um, we are talking about talent. We are talking about clients, customer bases who are now looking at companies and saying, what exactly do you stand for before, right. before I put my application or before I purchase an item or a product from you? What do you stand for? Because the other thing is um, people are being much more savvy and understand that their dollars speak volumes. And yes. I always tell my kids, if you are purchasing something, you need to make sure that you understand that company that you're purchasing from. What is their mission? What are their culture? What do they believe in? And what are they doing within their company that stands for that positivity? Like you said, it's not just yelling out Black Lives Matter. It's not just yelling out, we believe in women. It's not just yelling out, we hire those with different abilities. But it's really taking a look and saying, okay, when I pull up your website, um, you know, what things are you implementing? And when I pull up your website, what is your board of directors look like? Yep. So what I see is, you know, in California last year, they passed that law saying that there has to be one, at least one woman on a board of directors um, for a public company. Yep. And, you know, I see companies go, yes, I hired my one woman or I put my one woman on and I look at that. Yeah, let's check that box. You know, I meet that criteria and yet they have 20 seats. So what are you saying to us? You're saying to us that you only do what's necessary to check that box so that you look good in public. But meanwhile, you have not even hit, you know, 5% or 10% of those board members and yep. so it, i i really love the changes that are going on right now because people have to and if you are hiding behind um something that i see across linkedin right now is that's not an appropriate topic you know people say that's not an appropriate topic for linkedin linkedin is just business well guess what business also includes everybody so these are topics that yep. we have to talk about and have you seen any of those comments or what is it? How do you respond to people who say, you know what, this is something that we really don't want to talk about? Um, you know, I feel like 2020 is the year that ripped the Band-Aid off of <laughs> brushing anything under the rug. Thank goodness. I mean, there's been a lot of really difficult things in 2020 and, and that are still continuing to happen. but. I think one of the, I sincerely hope, lasting impacts of 2020 is that we no longer accept that statement. That's not appropriate. We shouldn't talk about that here. Because the reality is, you know, we can't separate work and personal lives. Our lives are holistic. And so if we are, if I am struggling because I have two elementary age students at my children, you know, students at home working virtually, or because I have a family member that's a frontline worker and I'm worried about their health, or I've lost someone with their health, or for so many of, you know, our black colleagues and, and colleagues of color who have borne the impact and experienced systemic racism, you know, throughout their entire personal and professional lives, um, only to have, you know, that the trauma of so much of, of the systemic racism and injustice, you know, be thrown in their faces in 2020. Um, we can't say, you know, that's not appropriate to talk about at work, you know, put, dry your eyes, you know, chin up, and, and you know deal with that on your own time. That's, that's not how we operate as people and that's not how organizations that are going to grow and thrive and be leaders will operate. And then another impact of 2020 that you know I, I truly believe will carry forward and I see as an incredible positive is that organizations now recognize that their employees' well-being matters. And some of them recognize that anyways. And they recognize that because they see their employees as humans. But others are recognizing that because employees' well-being 
is an indicator of their employee experience, which is the leading indicator in terms of performance within an organization. So no matter what the turning point was for leadership teams and for organizations and even for boards and shareholders to recognize that well-being matters, that recognition is there. And so part of that well-being is having these uncomfortable conversations, is normalizing that these uncomfortable and courageous conversations have to take place. So to go back to your questions, when people say, you know, that this isn't the place for it, or, you know, I'm not really comfortable with this conversation, um, I'm empathetic. You know, I, I can say, you know, I understand it's, it's not a comfortable topic, but the status quo is not an option. You know, we're not going to grow, we're not going to thrive, um, and we're not going to achieve success if we don't have these conversations. And if we don't normalize having these conversations, again, yeah. like, you know, hiring one female board member, this is not a check the box. It's not a having an uncomfortable conversation once and say, whew, boy, I made it through that one. It, it, it's normalizing that, that we have to continue to have these conversations. And we have to have them in our personal life too. We need to normalize these conversations, you know, in every aspect of our lives. Yeah, I think it's really important. And especially because those of us um, of color, we start having those conversations with our children very young. Yes. And um, we talk about safety and we talk about um, your surroundings and we talk about so those are those are things that we talk about as a, a normal topic from when our children are young and and then we get you know we get them into a place to work and they're like well nobody really wants to talk about this well, right. nobody wants to talk about this these are hard issues to talk about but I feel like it's also, or it used to be a way for people to hide what they thought and what their uh, personality was because they weren't open to having diversity. And those were the same companies that were very upset when some of the DNI um, laws came into play over the last decade. Yeah. Um, and, and so now exactly, you know, social media, that puts things much more out in the open. Yeah. And, I mean, we've actually seen in the last, let's say, six to eight months since 2020 came into play, um, we're seeing CEOs having to take responsibility for what they say and what they do. And, you know, much of that is because it's on video and it goes into social media and the people are demanding that, you know, if you're going to continue to run this company, I'm not going to be a client. I'm not going to be an employee yes. and I'm not going to be a customer. And, um, and, and we're seeing that those CEOs who are, let's say not strong in empathy and emotional intelligence, um, in having those change factors that they are having to quickly step out of that limelight or step out of those positions and we're starting to see companies say yes we are going to hire those people who really promote these discussions and these changes um you know emotional intelligence again was something that was a topic only come into play maybe two to five years um yeah. and we're really starting to see companies say we have to understand that when we are leaders and we are discussing things and when we are making changes within our company we have to understand how to speak to our client or our employees we need to understand that we cannot hold those conversations in leadership exactly the same way with everybody and so um this year is, has brought about many many changes and i'm really excited to see what you're doing this year um, you know we know that small businesses what is it? 50% don't make it out of three years. And it, so many of us have sat there and thought, well, we want to start a business, but we have that fear. And I am, I applaud you. Um, not only have you started a business 
in promoting and having a very positive message for people in an industry that it's very new to them. But you also are crossing over this discussion into organizations throughout the industry. You are showing others how you can create this change. Um, you are mentoring women who are looking for somebody to show them that direction because honestly, myself, I, I've had this discussion with others. We can get to a position where we think, okay, great. Um, but then there's no sponsor or mentor or somebody within an industry or a company who can say, okay, I've been where you're at and you know, I can lead you or I can at least show you the options you have to navigate your career. Right. And uh, right now is a time that we're seeing a lot of online education. Yes. The problem that I see with that is it's great to be able to pay some money and get online and find a topic. But if you don't have the support system that you need in order to continue that growth, um, we can we can become stagnant. So um, let's talk a little bit about how you coach women, um, because there is a difference between consulting and coaching. Absolutely. And let's talk a little bit about how you're coaching women and what difference you're able to make with them and how their confidence level or their ability to pivot maybe their careers that they didn't do before, how does that impact them? Sure. So with, with my coaching practice, I have really kind of two offerings. One is an accelerated offering, and that is typically around three months, um, once or even twice a week, and that is around one main initiative. So it could be you know preparing to go on maternity leave or return from a leave it could be um you know exploring career options saying okay I, here i am in my career you know what did how do i define my career journey assessment and how do i determine is there a role for me within this company and can i get that sponsorship and visibility i need to truly advance along that path or should i look externally um, it can be, you know, a change in leadership and helping coach someone through that. Um, unfortunately, I'm seeing a significant rise in this, but I, I coach women through toxic work environments as well um, in terms of how to um, navigate through that, how to protect yourself. And again, not, you know, not from a legal standpoint or a mental health standpoint, but just from um, really that human standpoint within an organization. Um, so I have this, you know, shorter term intensive coaching practice. And then I also have, um, a longer practice, which is just supporting women, you know, identifying kind of their career journey, um, metrics for success, and then helping coach them kind of just through, you know, through their role. And that could be, um, I'm having difficulty on an account team, or, you know, I have this opportunity, um, to pivot part-time into another you know specialty and how do I go about doing that and, and balancing or you know navigating through um, being a working parent or, or that move kind of right from being a rising star to starting to have authority and autonomy and responsibility on accounts and and that's where we start to lose women because that is the point where, you know, the, the very people, and this is women and men who championed you, will start to be those who exhibit the greatest degree of microaggressions towards you. And it's a very isolating and demoralizing time. And, you know, we don't necessarily lose women physically at that point, but we start to lose women mentally at that point of the workforce. So I want to help um, women really develop the tools for navigating through that for you know getting sponsorship and mentorship to navigate through that but then also for saying okay you know what are your definitions for success and at some point is this organization the right one you know for you and that doesn't always come into play but it does periodically and i think for a lot of women 
that contemplation of leaving is a very scary thing. Um, and, you know, I certainly would never advise someone on what to do or not to do, but I want to at least have that uncomfortable conversation and put metrics um, for evaluation in place so it can become a little bit less emotional when you're actually contemplating a specific role or a move, whether it's internal or external. Um, and you can really focus on what, you know, what that means for you and your career path. Um, so the degree, you know, to which I, I work with women and, and help women on their career um, really depends on what their objectives are. I think one of the unique um, perspectives that I bring to the table, and I hear my clients say this, is because A, I've been a woman working through this industry, working through a male-dominated industry. You know, I've experienced, like many of us, you know, discrimination, harassment, um, microaggressions. I've had incredible sponsorship. I've been given great visibility. Um, I've had incredible leadership. You know, I've had kind of all sides of the coins, but I've experienced it. And, and all of our experiences will be different. Right. Um, but at least, you know, I have a lens that can relate somewhat um, to what typically my clients are going through. You know, there's at least a little parallel. But the other piece is I worked on the management and leadership side. So I ran account teams. I worked to get people promoted. I identified when people were getting discriminated against and worked internally to, you know, strategically address that. So the kind of coaching that I bring to the table is not only personal, but it's also how to navigate through an organization. And while I might not know the organization, I at least know the operational side and the promotional side and how you do have to get sponsorship and championship and visibility. And I can also, you know, help my clients identify when, you know, if they've tried a number of different steps, when it looks like, you know, this this organization may not be culturally right. aligned to support you. Um, right. So it depends on, on what, you know, my clients needs are, um, but my objective is to help them feel like, you know, they truly have an understanding of what drives and motivates them. They have some consistent benchmarks for evaluating how they're progressing on their personal career journey. And that, you know, depending on what their need is at the time, where they are on that journey, you know, that I'm working and coaching them to give them the tools that they need to progress through that moment. And, you know, sometimes it's more strategic, sometimes it's coaching and we'll do, you know, mock calls together or discussions together or what if scenarios together. It, it, it depends on the client. Um, but just as I approach my career, you know, I want to help each client with developing some longer term benchmarks for success and then work on the immediate kind of tools and support and coaching to navigate that current stage of career journey. So I love that. And it's also because what we see, like I said, is um, we have the opportunity to go online and there are these companies or these women who have done an amazing job to create these multi-million dollar companies. And um, part of that includes their online education. Um, but sometimes we need that extra support system. And that's something that I talk to my community of women about all the time. So when we look at the pro firm or beauty and beast in business, um, you know, I've created this community of women within the risk management claims um, industry. And some of that question continues to come about, well, maybe I need this certification and maybe I need, and it is amazing. It is great to have that education. But I continue to tell people, you need to find people, not even just within your company, but within your industry and even outside your industry. Yes. Because sometimes we pigeonhole ourselves and we're yeah. like, okay, well, all we can see is, you know, this is where, this is a circle of insurance or work comp or risk. And so I have to have all my connections within that circle. And it, it kind of stunts sometimes the continued growth. So, you know, that's something that we talk about a lot. And we have been online almost an hour, which 
has flown <laughs> by, has flown by. And we really talked about some important topics. I look forward to our quarterly discussions because um, for those out, out there watching, my viewers, um, this is just the first of our quarterly discussions. Megan and I are going to continue to have discussions around DNI, around how women can pivot their um, careers and find something that fits them, fits their mission and growth. We're going to talk about sponsorship and mentorship and lots of other things out there that really are not just particular to women, but particular to somebody who is looking to, to navigate and grow their careers. So Megan, thank you so much for joining me today. I have had a blast and I can't wait to talk to you again. Yes. Thank you so much, Angel. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate the opportunity and, and really enjoyed our conversation. Stop.